Okay, it's one o'clock. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I would like to thank everybody for attending today uh, we, on our webinar, uh, Protecting Migratory Bird Pollinators and Insectivores, Beneficial Birds as Natural Pest Control. Um, we have some really great speakers today. Um, I'm Sherilyn Peterson and I work for NCAP, which is the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides. And I'm joined by Emily Summerlin from PAN, Pesticide Action Network. And we have a couple great speakers as well today. So first off, um, we have Dr. Inoue. Uh, he is a professor emeritus, University of Maryland, College Park. Um, really excited to have you here today to talk to us. Um, you've done a lot of different research on everything from hummingbirds to glossing bees to to fritted flies um, and pollination and looking at different um, nectar feeding habitat or behavior, I'm sorry. And um, you are also involved in teaching at the Rocky Mountain uh, Laboratory as well. Um, so I'm really, like I said, we're really excited to have you here today. Um, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, I'll get out of mine. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about is uh, a big word here, ornithophily, which refers to pollination by birds. And the picture here is uh, a broad-tailed hummingbird. That's the species of hummingbird that reproduces here at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. They fly up here from Mexico, spend the summer, uh, raise their babies, and actually the last one left here probably a, a couple of days ago. Uh, most of them started leaving around the beginning or beginning of September, headed, headed back to Mexico for the winter. And those of you that know uh, broad-tailed hummingbirds know that they make a, a whistle when they fly, a mechanical wing whistle. And you can sort of see in this picture here, uh, between the first and second feathers, the primary feathers on the wing, there's a little bit of a slot. And that slot is what makes the mechanical whistle when the birds are, are flapping their wings very rapidly. And they're good pollinators. So this, this one's visiting flowers of the uh, Nelson's Larkspur, which is one of the first uh, wildflowers to bloom in the spring here. I thought I'd just show one slide about the history of, whoops, the history of hummingbirds, uh, because they are so important as pollinators. And actually, uh, they used to be, or their ancestors used to be in Europe. Uh, modern day hummingbirds are only found in the Americas, but at least this ancestral hummingbird from about 30 million years ago in Europe is from a fossil that was found uh, not very long ago and gives us some idea about the history of this. Uh, this one actually, uh, the fossil is good enough that it preserved the stomach contents and you can tell that this bird had pollen grains in its stomach. So this fossil is uh, perhaps the first and uh, best evidence that we have so far that flowers and birds have had a, a history, a co-evolved history for uh, tens of millions of years now. There are, there are now 338 species of hummingbirds. Uh, they moved into South America about 22 million years ago. And then when the Andes uh, were uplifted, uh, that uh, creation of ge geological barriers and uh, varied altitudinal habitats created, helped to create, or result in the creation of these 140 or so species of South American hummingbirds. Uh, a lot of them had very restricted ranges, which might imply that they're also uh, not very old evolutionarily yet. And different groups or different clades of hummingbirds are, are continuing to diversify at different rates. And some of them are actually uh, diversifying at pretty rapid rates, which tells us that uh, in the not too distant future, at least uh, geologically speaking, there are going to be new species of hummingbirds that, that we don't have now and evolving uh, new relationships with additional flowers. Overall, there are as many as 50 families of birds that have been reported to have species that will visit flowers and can potentially pollinate those flowers. Uh, the map here shows the geographical distribution of three of those families, the hummingbirds on the top uh, in North America, Central America, and South America. 
um, the sunbirds, which are distributed in Africa, across parts of Southern Asia, and also into uh, Australia. And then the honey eaters, uh, which are restricted to uh, Australia and New Guinea, that part of the world. So uh, just about anywhere you are in the world where there are flowering plants, you could potentially find uh, some that are visited by and probably pollinated by birds. This is an interesting uh, picture from the cover of the journal, uh, American Journal of Botany. And what it shows is a, uh, a sunbird visiting a plant in the iris family. And these plants have evolved to produce a, uh, what's called a, colloquially a rat's tail here. And what it does is it serves as a perch for the sunbirds to hold on as they're bending over to feed on the nectar from the flowers down below. And this uh, perch situates them physically in, in the best possible place for their heads to be serving as vectors for pollen from these flowers. So that's a, a kind of neat example of how closely uh, plants and their pollinators can evolve even when those pollinators are birds. Flowers that are pollinated by birds uh, often are a very good match with the shape of the bill of those birds, both the length of the bill and the amount of curvature. And here are a couple of pictures of some spectacular uh, South American hummingbirds uh, visiting flowers. And you can see those flowers don't have very long, long corolla tubes and therefore uh, don't need a very long bird to, to visit that, those flowers to get the nectar. Let me go back here just a slide. No, I didn't. Somewhere in here, I think I have the link uh, for the website where that uh, where this slide came from. But you can probably track it down if you Google hummingbirds and flowers. Uh, here's another great example of how uh, extreme the morphology can be on a hummingbird. In this case, a sickle-billed hummingbird. Uh, and the, the central pogon flower that it visits. And you can see how, how well that uh, those two match morphologically, allowing the hummingbird to get to the nectar here at the base of the flower. And then the reproductive parts of the flower, the stigma and the uh, anthers that would dust pollen and then pick that pollen off the top of the head of a visiting hummingbird. Uh, in the lower right is the sickle bill, or sorry, sword, what's it called, sword, um, Short something hummingbird. That's also shown here on the left and you can get some idea of the range of shapes, sword build hummingbird. Get some idea of the shapes and uh, curvature of different species of hummingbird's bills. And here's a, uh, a color plate that was drawn in 1904 from a naturalist who was able to travel throughout South America and get some idea of the diversity of colors and shapes and sizes of hummingbirds. Uh, the picture on the right shows the smallest hummingbird in the world, probably the smallest bird species in the world, uh, one of the bumblebee hummingbirds. <clears throat> one of the interesting behaviors that insects and birds have when they visit flowers is to serve as what are called nectar robbers. And in the upper left here is a picture of a bumblebee, which is uh, biting a hole in this flower. And you might guess because this flower is red, uh, that it's a hummingbird pollinated flower, or at least bird pollinated. Uh, but that bumblebee doesn't have a tongue long enough to stick its head here and reach all the way back to where the nectar is. So what it does instead is to bite a hole in the flower and then it can reach the nectar. That's a baby behavior called nectar robbing, which has been studied by scientists for a long time, including uh, Charles Darwin. And then there's a, uh, a, there are a number of birds, a group of birds called the flower piercers, and you can see one of them here using its bill uh, to make a hole in this flower. And it's going to do the same thing, uh, uh, sticking its tongue in to get the nectar at the base of the flower because its bill and tongue are not long enough to go in from the front of the flower. So that's an interesting behavior that uh, is still being studied in terms of what are the consequences for the flowers of having something coming along and biting a hole in them and taking out the nectar. Included in the diversity of uh, bird families that are visiting flowers and are parrots. In the upper left is a picture of a parrot biting down on a mistletoe flower. And, and mistletoe has a pretty unusual flower. And this, this species, uh, the buds actually have to be pinched 
in order to open the flower and uh, to pollinate the flower. And these parrots uh, actually serve that role of helping to bite on the buds and open up the flowers and uh, pollinate them. And on the lower right is a lorikeet flowering, uh, visiting flowers of a, a corymbia flowers, and in this case also pollinating those flowers. There's some pretty interesting information known about hummingbird tongues now. So there's an artificial flower cutaways so you can see the hummingbird's tongue feeding on colored nectar, colored sugar water. in slow motion. So they stick it into the nectar, it wicks up nectar, and then when they retract their tongue into their bill, it squeezes the nectar out of the tongue and they can swallow it. And that's some work that was done by scientists at the University of Connecticut. Okay, so that, that's uh, sort of a general survey about ornithophily or bird pollination. And I wanna talk a little bit in detail about some of the research that's being done here at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory on hummingbirds. And my first summer here, which was 50 years ago, I was a student in a class taught by uh, Bill Calder, a physiological ecologist uh, from the University of Arizona. And uh, he got interested in hummingbirds while he was out here. and. Uh, did some really neat work on them. Uh, he was able to put an artificial hummingbird egg in a nest and that egg had a, th a thermometer in it and he was able to document what happened to the bird's temperature when a female was stressed because of rainstorms and cold weather so she had to stay on her nest keeping the eggs warm. It wasn't able to go out and feed very much and here uh, oh maybe about 8 30 in the evening she went out and fed for the last time that day, uh, went and sat, sat in her nest, kept the eggs warm. And then because she was energy stressed, she turned down the thermostat on her body. She went into torpor and went hypothermic. And you can see the temperature dropped and dropped and dropped. And then uh, came back up in the morning and uh, Bill Calder was able to document that those eggs were still able to hatch successfully, even though they, they had that experience of being kept cold at night. Research that's being done now uh, on hummingbirds here includes work uh, by a graduate student from UC Berkeley. This is Nicholas Alexander on the left, and he's gotten interested in uh, variation in the shapes and the lengths of hummingbird bills. So he's caught several hundred hummingbirds out here over the last uh, three or four years, measured their bill length, and here are the bill lengths shown separately for males and females. Males tend to have somewhat shorter bills. Uh, these would be the means here, and then probably plus or minus a, a, a standard deviation or two, and then the range. So there can be as much as, a, as a four millimeters, maybe even five millimeters difference in the length of the bills of these broad-tailed hummingbirds within a single species. And then what he's been doing is taking pollen grains off the heads of the birds and on their chins, uses a piece of um, scotch tape or sticky tape, uh, uses it to wipe pollen grains off, puts that on a, a microscope, and then identifies the pollen grains so he can tell which species of flowers the birds have been visiting. And for example, uh, here what he's showing is um, plotted against the curvature of the bills, so showing how curved are the birds' bills, whether or not the birds have pollen from Ipomopsis, a uh, common name is scarlet gilia. And, that's up here on the, uh, that picture that was on the upper left there was an Ipomopsis flower. And so you can see it takes a long build to get the nectar back down there. It's a red flower as are most uh, hummingbird pollinated flowers. And the ones that are visiting that Ipomopsis tend to have sh uh, more, uh, less curved bills. And note that that's a pretty straight flower tube. So the birds that have, um, I'm sorry, I'm, let's see, I think I'm, I read that, that wrong, wrong, okay. So lower curvature, less curvature are the birds that tend to have the Ipomopsis pollen present. And the birds with more curved bills don't tend to visit that flower. 
They're visiting other kinds of, of flowers. Uh, similarly, for bill length, the ones that are visiting the Ipomopsis are the ones that tend to have longer bills. So Nicholas got interested in the question of whether there's a genetic basis for that, those differences. And so what he's done is to uh, cut a, about a millimeter of toenail on the bird and take a little bit of blood. Uh, bird blood is very rich in DNA and these birds regrow their toenail. We, we've recaptured the, those birds the next year and their toenails are all, all their toenails completely regrown. And what he's done then is to take DNA from birds with short bills, DNA from birds with long bills, and then uh, do a genetic analysis to look for mutations that might be characteristic of the birds with short bills uh, and other mutations that might characterize the birds with long bills. And so he, he now has the genomes or the complete uh, set of genes for about, I think about 300 uh, individual broad-tailed hummingbirds that we collected here out at the Rocky Mount Biological Lab. And he's using those uh, genomes to try and find what's the genetic basis for those differences in uh, bill shape and bill curvature. And presumably those same genes are the ones that would have been involved in differentiation of hummingbirds like this sword-billed hummingbird or the other uh, sickle-billed hummingbirds or other, other birds like that. So uh, within uh, a year or two, we should, should know a lot about the genetics behind this variation in bill shape and curvature. And so that group is the, uh, the humming nerd group, including uh, Nicholas Alexandra and some of his uh, research assistants. That work's done here at the biological lab. And uh, he's also, uh, we've had to get permits from uh, both the US Fish and Wildlife Service and Colorado Parks and Wildlife in order to capture those birds. My, um, my own research here that I focus on primarily has to do with wildflowers, including uh, the, when they come into bloom, which is the science of phenology, that's the word here at the end. Um, and the way we study this is by uh, going out three times a week and counting every flower in a set of plots that are uh, two by two meter plots, about six feet on a side. And I set these plots up in 1973 and we've looked at them every year since then. And uh, we're fortunate enough to have some uh, support from the National Science Foundation for that research that allows us to hire our, our research assistants to help with those flower counts. And uh, we've now counted, I forget how many million, something like five or six million flowers over the, the decades since 1973. And uh, this is now one of the, the most complete, uh, most detailed and longest records uh, looking at uh, the uh, variation in the abundance and the timing of flowering. Uh, we're studying about 120 different species of wildflowers in these plots. Uh, so that's a pretty phenomenal record that we have. And thanks to you that are taxpayers, who, because about that much of your taxes goes to the National Science Foundation, and, and about that much of that National Science Foundation grant helps to keep that project going. So one of the things we've looked at is how is the timing of flowering influenced by when the snow melts? Because the growing season can't start up here until the snow's gone. Um, and if you look at how much snow is still left on the ground on the 30th of April up here, it can be anywhere from zero in a, a year of early snow melt, the snow's already all gone, uh, to uh, as late as uh, early June when the snow melts. And, and in, that, in a year like that on the 30th of April, uh, there may still be six or seven feet of snow on the ground. So uh, what I've plotted here are two things. One is for the glacier lily, which are the first flowers to bloom after the snow melts that are visited by hummingbirds. So these yellow dots show that if there's not much snow, the glacier lilies start blooming earlier. If there's a lot of snow, then it may not be until, let's see, almost a day 170. So there's almost a month and a half difference between day 130, two here and uh, day 170 uh, in terms of when those glacier lilies come into bloom. So if you're a hummingbird and you're spending the winter down in Mexico and you're trying to figure out when should I arrive up in the Rocky Mountains in time for breeding season, uh, you've got to deal with the fact that there could be a uh, three week or longer difference from one year to the next in terms of when the flowers are going to be there for you to visit. The red dots here 
uh, the date of the year when we first heard, or a friend of mine who spends the whole winter up here, first heard one of these male broad-tailed hummingbirds, which have this whistle, wing whistle that I mentioned. And you can see that in years of early snow melt, the birds show up earlier. Years of late snow melt, they show up later, but they're not changing their timing as much as the flowers are. The slope of those two lines are not parallel. And the hummingbirds are not responding as quickly uh, to the changing climate as the flowers are. One implication of this is that it could be that sometime in the future, the uh, flowers are gonna be in bloom and the hummingbirds won't, won't be here yet. Uh, so that's an example of how, as the climate changes, uh, different partners in relationships like pollination uh, are going to be having to change their timing or else uh, find new partners to interact with. We've kept track of things like the growing season here. And over the years, uh, the growing season is getting longer. Uh, that small graph up, up at the top shows. In the lower graph, we've split our study period into two intervals, the early years in blue uh, from 1974 to 2002 and later years in, in red. And you can see in later years, the growing season is starting earlier and it's also ending later. There are two peaks of flowering here. There's an earlier peak and a later peak. And as the growing season is getting longer, those two peaks are getting pulled further apart, which is creating a low spot here in the middle uh, where there are not as many flowers. But that's the time when bumblebees need nectar to feed their babies and hummingbirds need nectar to feed their babies. And so we're a little concerned that as these peaks of flowering are spreading further and further apart as the climate changes, that that's going to start creating more problems for pollinators in the middle of the summer. So that's another long-term project we're trying to keep track of. So if we were to stylize flowering and say, let's say this is the, the, uh, the glacial lily, the first flower to bloom, and then there's, uh, it comes into bloom, it peaks, and then it ends flowering. And then another species, let's say the larkspur, uh, starts flowering, has peak flowering, and ends flowering. That historically, there was this relationship among species. Well, what happens as the, as, the, as the climate's changing? Does that whole pattern just shift uniformly to earlier dates or does something else happen? And that's the kind of question we can now answer with the, the data we've been collecting. Well, it turns out that's not what's happening. What's happening is each species is responding differently. So some of them are just moving but keeping the same shape of the flowering curve. Others uh, are uh, spreading their flowering out over a much longer period. Uh, some are actually uh, condensing their flowering into a shorter period. So the flower communities up here that support the pollinators are changing their nature. And uh, pollinators therefore are f finding different things on the menu that they used to, than they used to have up here. And we've measured this for bumblebees, for small solitary bees, for flies, for butterflies and for hummingbirds, trying to look at uh, for hummingbirds, for instance, the number of poor floral abundance days it, it is not changing a whole lot. It's staying right around zero. But for bumblebees, it's changed pretty dramatically. There are a lot more poor floral abundance days for bumblebees, for small bees, for flies, and for butterflies than there used to be up here. So these uh, measures that we have of floral resources are changing differently among different species of wildflowers and they're also changing differently for different pollinator species. And here, here's a, again the broad-tailed hummingbird in this case visiting um, a columbine flower, a red columbine. And I, I'll finish up with just one last slide and story about a, a, another ongoing project here. So uh, about three years ago, a young faculty member, uh, uh, actually was, she was just starting her position at Princeton University. Her name is Cassie Stoddard. Uh, and she got, she's interested in bird vision and she wanted to work with hummingbirds. And she somehow got a hold of my name and said, I understand you work at a field station where there are hummingbirds and I'd like to do this project and I don't have the permits for catching hummingbirds and I, I've heard that you do and would you collaborate with me? And so. We've now collaborated for four years. And 
the technique that she uses for studying hummingbird vision is to have two feeding stations. She has two tripods here with hummingbird feeders. And uh, on each of those tripods, uh, one of the feeders has a sugar solution and the other one just has water. And the birds will go back and forth and they'll explore to see which, uh, uh, which feeder is the best one to go visit. And she associates with each of those feeders a light source. She has a, a light source that she can tune the light frequency anywhere from infrared up to ultraviolet and, uh, and then put different frequencies of light with the different feeders and look to see how quickly can the birds learn to associate a particular color with a particular reward or lack of reward and then uh, she can swap the positions and see if the birds track the light source uh, as a way of keeping track of which is the rewarding feeder to visit. And hummingbirds, uh, as do some other birds, have, um, they can see four different colors. We can only see three. We only have the, the genes and the uh, uh, cones in our retina for detecting blue light, green light, and red light. But hummingbirds have a fourth cone that can detect ultraviolet light. So they can see uh, patterns on flowers that we can't see because those patterns are in ultraviolet uh, reflectance. And potentially, they can be seeing a whole array of colors that we can't see, which would include mixtures with that UV. And so uh, the latest, uh, Actually, the paper that just came out this summer describing that project showed that hummingbirds can detect a, a UV plus red. It's just, so if, he has, if she tunes her, her light source to include both ultraviolet and red, hummingbirds recognize that as a, as a color distinct from any other color. Uh, the closest we can come to imagining that is that if we think about the color purple, which we can see, it's because we're seeing a stimulation of both our blue cones and our red cones together. There is, no, there is no purple cone, but if you have red and blue stimulated at the same time, our brains, our eyes and our brains see that as purple. And hummingbirds can see red plus ultraviolet as some kind of color that we, we can only sort of imagine in our minds. Uh, we'll never be able to see that color ourselves because we don't see ultraviolet. So uh, one thing that we've been doing is putting uh, pit tags. Those are the tiny little tags that uh, a veterinarian will inject under the skin of your pet cat or dog. So if it gets lost and somebody finds it, they can take it to a vet and the vet can scan the tag and identify that, that animal. Well, uh, what Cassie does is to put an antenna around the feeder and we glue those pit tags onto the back of the birds and so when a tagged bird flies through the antenna, she can tell which bird went to which feeder. And uh, that's the technique that's going to allow her to explore other characteristics of, of hummingbird vision here at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. Unfortunately, she didn't make it out here this summer because of COVID, but hopefully uh, her research program will be on track next year. Uh, she and uh, her collaborator at, at UC Berkeley just gotten a National Science Foundation grant for their hummingbird research and that'll uh, keep them out here for the next four summers. So I think I will stop there and uh, depending on what the moderators want to do, we'll either try to answer some questions now or, or we'll wait till the end. But thanks for your attention. Oh, thank you so much, David. That was really fascinating stuff that I I didn't realize there's so many different shapes of, of bills on hummingbirds. So, as well as some of the research that you guys have done and are doing. Um, actually, the questions, we'll just go ahead and um, we're compiling them right now. So let's go ahead and answer all the questions at the end. Our second speaker is Joanne Baumgartner. She's the executive director from the Wild Farm Alliance. Uh, she's an author of many publications on the intersection between biodiversity conservation and ag, um, including Beneficial Birds, which she's written uh, many documents on and books. Um, she is, before she joined WFA in 2001, she addressed crop, livestock, and fiber issues and was a senior research editor for a book of California's rare wildlife species. Um, we're really happy to have you, Joanne. You can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Okay. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about protecting bird insectivores and carnivores. And um, a lot of this information is in our bird booklet, Supporting Beneficial Birds and Managing Pest Birds that we published last year. I am a co-author with Dr. Sarah Cross and Dr. Sasha Heath. And um, you can download this publication for free from our website at wildfarmalliance.org. Um, so what I'm gonna cover are the numbers and types of birds, pest control services of birds, including the historical knowledge of that research and giving some examples. Uh, and then I'm gonna end with making farms and gardens more bird friendly. Um, at this last year, we've learned that there's a significant decline of North American birds. Over 3 billion birds have been lost since 1970. And if you look at the bar chart on the left bottom, you can see that grasslands have been most significantly affected. And then others, uh, other types of uh, our birds in different ecosystems have. If you look at the top on the right, wetland birds are actually increasing. And that wasn't the case so long ago, but people realized that wetland birds were in trouble and they put lots of funding and uh, work into um, both conserving what wetlands we have and restoring wetlands. And so I'm just pointing this out that we can with concerted effort um, start to turn this around. Birds are on the farm depending on uh, how they eat and when and where they are here. So on the farm or in a garden. And again, I'm, gonna, I'm showing you some bird um, uh, beaks. Uh, and I want to point out that this slide is uh, from one of our co-authors, Sasha Heath, and some other slides uh, maybe from her or Sarah. And um, so, uh, yeah, besides their be bird beaks, it could be that um, they are on the farm because of the way they're foraging. Some birds uh, are down in, on the ground or in shrubs, some are in mid canopy or upper canopy. And then it depends on if they're resident uh, or migrating birds, whether they're gonna be around and helping, uh, helping with pest control. What is really a cool thing to understand is that the overwhelming majority of songbirds are beneficial during the nesting season because they feed insects to their young. Now some birds, most of the birds are, are beneficial most of the time. There are some birds that can be a beneficial and also a problem. This uh, female red-winged blackbird has insects in her beak and she's beneficial feeding those insects to her young. Later on though, she may uh, become a problem eating seed crops. This chart, um, I'm going to get a look, we're going to focus in on it a little bit more, but you, uh, it is part of our bird booklet and you can just see it's uh, identifying insectivores and carnivore uh, birds. Uh, so specifically, there's insectivores like the ash-throated flycatcher that will use a nest box. Um, there are other insectivores like cliff swallows that will build nests under eaves. There's insectivores like bush tits and yellow warblers that build woven nests in vegetation, so they need that vegetation. <clears throat> There's carnivores that will build nests on platforms or in uh, habitat, and, um, and uh, like the great blue herons, which will help with uh, rodent pest control in flooded alfalfa fields. Uh, and barn owls help with pest control of rodents in lots of different situations, and they will use uh, natural cavities and or nest boxes. But there are also birds that are omnivores and granivores, and so like that red-winged blackbird, we want to support them when they're beneficial and then manage them when they're not. This is a Sarah Cross slide that is showing that there's pest, avian pest control studies that have been happening all around the world. The corn and apples and coffee and grapes and lots of different crops. 
And the actual study of this uh, happened, began in 1880s when the precursor to the USDA started this economic ornithology department. And for the next 40 years, they looked at what birds were eating. They did stomach analysis, they used observation, and then the pesticide era came to be. And that all of that research just kind of um, lay or, you know, was, uh, did not continue until maybe 20 years ago, um, there's been a resurgence and uh, lots of, uh, lots of avian pest control research is, is occurring. And some of it is where uh, researchers now will allow birds in part of a farm and not in other parts. So they exclude it from part and compare what pests um, are being eaten. Uh, they're also getting more sophisticated looking at, well, not just what the bird is eating, but is that helpful to the crop um, and to the bottom line? They're using predictions to do modeling. They're using DNA analysis to test the feces of birds uh, to look at what they're eating and also if they're carrying any kind of foodborne pathogens that could be a problem. And they're looking at how habitat on the farm and in the landscape influences bird presence and pest control. In our bird booklet, in the appendix, there's all, almost 120 studies that we've compiled and about 90% of them show that birds are reducing pest insects. And that is in all kinds of crops and uh, um, birds that are reducing pest insects in uh, fruit and nuts and um, uh, row crops and field crops and uh, birds that are reducing other pest birds and rodents. So um, lots, of, lots of different cases. And I'm gonna go through a few right now. So this um, is a picture of a, a bird in an apple orchard. And I did my master's looking at birds eating codling moth. Um, in, uh, I'm in uh, Central California, but uh, researchers have looked at uh, different birds in, in different parts of the world, helping to reduce the same pest insects in apples because people grow apples everywhere. And there's a big range, but up to 99% of the overwintering codling moth is uh, sometimes eaten. This study, uh, hedgerows are helping to support birds that will eat up to 24% of sentinel pest insects that are put out in the crop. So that's experimental insects that the birds eat. With this, uh, this was Sarah Cross's research in alfalfa fields and that with at least two trees in alfalfa field, birds would reduce pest alfalfa weevils by over 33%. This study showed how um, barn swallows will reduce um, the oil seed rape pests. Uh, the researchers looked at the fecal sacs that um, they collected underneath the, the nest and found that there was 18% of those pests in their feces. Julie Jedlicka here was looking at um, birds in and putting up boxes in vineyards and found that there was a tenfold increase of bluebirds when nest boxes were used. And when she put out sentinel pest insects, they would eat two and a half times more near the nest boxes. In this study with strawberries, we were finding that it's, it's a little more complicated because in general, there are birds that are beneficial like the two birds above. Uh, Phoebe and a uh, flycatcher, and then the two birds below will um, eat the crop. But what's so interesting is that farm management can change that dynamic significantly. So a diversified farm that has habitat on the farm like hedgerows, also diverse cropping systems with cover crops and compost can really support so that give birds so many resources that they that on average they would damage the crop by three percent. Whereas this, when researchers were look, these researchers looking at uh, monocultures of strawberries, they're finding that the birds ha have a huge impact on the crop and in a negative way. And um, 
uh, that's because there's nothing else for them to eat. So they eat strawberries, even some of the beneficial birds. In, this, uh, in these examples with almonds on the left and olives on the right, uh, the birds in both cases eat a little bit of the crop uh, before harvest, but then they eat the mummies afterwards. Mummies are the name of uh, the crop that's left after harvest that can support um, diseases and pest insects if it's not removed. So the grower has to remove those and the birds come in and do it for them. And in, in that case of almonds, a uh, study showed that it was actually uh, cost effective to have the birds there, even though they ate some of the, the nuts ahead of time before harvest. Matt Johnson at Humboldt State University has been studying barn owls for the last five years with grad students and some of the great research he's found uh, putting tracking devices on the owls was that while the owls might have a box on a vineyard, they'll only hunt at the vineyard about a third of the time. A third of the time they're in grasslands and the rest of the time they might be in oak savanna and riparian and uh, maybe so, some other little bit of habitat. <clears throat> but mostly what this is telling them is that these other kinds of habitat are important for the barn owl. And in fact, when those habitats are close by within a mile, the birds will occupy nest boxes much more often. Their research has found that two adults and four nestlings will kill a thousand rodents. And if <clears throat> a grower were to put 20 boxes on their farm, that would be 20,000 rodents, which is amazing. Um, Sarah Cross's work is showing that uh, in uh, looking at uh, perches with uh, her grad student showed that it, when perches are put up on a farm, they really need to be put away from trees and up on hills because if they're near trees, the birds are going to use the trees and if they're down, well, if they're up above, they have uh, better vision, better uh, um, yeah, they just like it better, obviously. So, but this um, research was looking at how instead of using a structural perch, you can grow your perches with sunflowers and or sometimes growers are using sorghum, some kind of tall plant uh, next to the shorter crop where their structure for birds to come in and hunt from and help to reduce pest insects. In Michigan, um, cherry growers are putting up American kestrel boxes and saving millions of dollars. The kestrels will eat mostly rodents, it turns out, but they scare the heck out of pest birds that eat cherries. And so their presence makes all the difference. This is Sarah Cross, and she uh, studied New Zealand falcons in New Zealand. They are a rare falcon that had been pushed out of their habitat up into the mountains, but um, she uh, brought them back down to where now that habitat is all vineyards, and they actually did really well um, there and helped to reduce the pest birds that were impacting uh, grape harvest, so much so that they really help growers save a lot of money. And here in the U.S., we have lots of falcons as opposed to New Zealand only has one falcon. So um, we should be supporting our falcons as much as possible. And uh, this is another study of Sarah's where she's looking at sunflowers. What we, what she found was that the it, the damage to sunflowers is mostly insects. And she was looking at, well, if, if birds were damaging the sunflowers, did it have anything to do with hedgerows? And she found that it didn't because it was the big flocking birds, uh, big flocks of birds that were um, uh, causing the damage that was occurring in the sunflowers, not birds that occur in the hedgerows. And this is an important fact because sometimes people think, that, oh, uh, I'll remove habitat and then I won't have pest birds. But it's these huge flocks um, that, um, sorry, I don't know what that was. There's, it's these huge flocks that are uh, 
moving long distances from one crop to the other. And they use those big, that big flocking strategy to avoid predators as opposed to hiding in a vegetation. So um, while there can be some uh, individuals that will hide in uh, cover, uh, vegetative cover, it's they do not cause the same kind of damage that these huge flocking birds like starlings would. So um, where do um, crop pests uh, exist on the farm? Well, there's air, they're in the air like fine pest insects and birds, they're on orchard trees and they're on bushes and low growing plants in the ground. And so what does that mean for supporting birds? So if you want to help uh, bring birds in that are going to eat airborne insects, you need bird swallows. Excuse me, provide tree swallows with bird boxes or allowing um, barn swallows and cliff swallows to nest in uh, barns in, on, um, under the eaves. There's also fly catchers. Um, they need vegetative habitat to nest in. And then falcons like Cooper's hawks and those American kestrels will scare pest birds and sometimes eat them. And the falcons need vegetation. When we heard that the kestrels are going to use boxes. <clears throat> In the orchards where there's bark gleaning birds like woodpeckers, they'll make their own cavities. But so sometimes that's in the, the orchard, but it's also in a day cat and they need places to do that. Um, there's also other kinds of birds that are gleaning bark like the chickadees and or warblers that are gleaning insects from, um, from the leaves. And the, uh, the chickadees will nest in a cavity. Uh, as you can see, uh, there was one in that apple tree or they, uh, the warblers need vegetation for nesting. Bluebirds are nesting or are using uh, like vineyards, shrubs, and on the ground for foraging, and they use those nest boxes. There's juncos that uh, forage on the ground, and they um, they need vegetative habitat. Other ground uh, pests are rodents, so that's the raptors that are eating them, and uh, we talked about what they need uh, boxes and perches. <coughs> So you can design a farm or garden for birds using different foraging strategies. And you can see all of these different kinds of strategies. It's basically they're on the ground, they're, fo they're foliage or bark gleaners, or they're flying. <coughs> Excuse me. And I've been on farms that have all these birds and support all these kinds of habitat. And it, it's, it's, it's delightful and, and functional. So if you want to manage your land for birds, what, how do you do that? Well, bird watching is step one. Um, if you don't know your birds, this is a great app to download Merlin Bird App uh, by Cornell. It helps you figure out what kind of bird you have. Um, another, there's several Cornell online resources. This one is all about birds. You can learn more about their history and listen to their songs. This is a great uh, Cornell site, eBird, if you want to figure out, like, for instance, if I wanted to know if there was bluebirds in my area, I would go to eBird, click on species maps, and put in western bluebird, and all of this came up. So I knew that if I put in a bluebird box, I would get bluebirds, which we have. We've done that a lot on the farm area. Um, so step two, supporting birds, which we've been talking about with structural and vegetative habitat, but also water and, and we have to manage the, the farm fields and gardens to be safe. <clears throat> so we talked about these structures. Uh, there's nest box plans from Cornell's Nest Watch website where you can download plans. If you have the luck to have repairing habitat, Vegetating it, it, it and or conserving what's already there is so important for the birds. And if you don't, um, uh, putting in habitat with hedgerows and windbreaks and any odd shaped place on the, 
on your land that can, um, where you can add some habitat is, can be important. Now, birds, I talked about how birds eat insects. Um, this just shows that 16 out of 20 bird families are eating insects. The green bars are that are eating. And Doug Tallamy has found uh, that certain types of plants support lots of a caterpillar, lat lettered lepidopteran species. And in the East Coast, the oak genus will support over 500 of these caterpillars. Here in California, they support over 200. In any case, that is a huge amount of food and really important for birds. So um, really, impo really important to to include those kinds in, in the planting design. Um, Audubon has a native plant uh, website that you can look at to uh, find more about that. So providing water helps is important for birds because they need to keep their wing, their feathers clean. They need to, in, in the swallow's case, have mud to build boxes or build nests. And then managing the uh, farm and garden safely is super important. A new study has come out that showed that nicotine, ni, neonicotinoid pest insecticides are uh, causing some of the decline of birds um, in the U.S. <clears throat> we know that these neonics are uh, um, interfering with bird migration. Um, there's all sides that are really problematic, especially the second generation that will accumulate in the rodent before it dies and is really toxic for to, to eat. <clears throat> Instead, it's really good just to use traps and gopherslimited.org has many examples of traps to use. Uh, cats are a problem. They kill lots and lots of birds here in my garden. Uh, we have a catio, so part of the garden is for the cats and part of the garden supports these native birds like you see here. And I've heard someone say that if everybody who got a kitten um, started to keep their cats in a catio instead of letting them roam, in 15 years it would make a huge difference uh, in the bird populations. But in meanwhile, if there's cats around and you're putting up boxes, there are predator guards and you got that at nest watch. So in summary, it's good to use nest boxes, perches, platforms, and ledges uh, to support birds. Uh, it's also important to conserve, plant, and restore native habitat. Water sources are important. Managing and coexisting with pest birds. And then taking care when there's cats and other predators around and when you're using pesticides. <clears throat> so again, here is our bird resource. I want to show you a couple other things that are really fun. This is on our website, Benefits of Birds on the Farm. And there's two tabs I want to point out, the farmer success stories, which <clears throat> we just released another four minute video. Um, this one's pest problems increase without bird habitat with uh, farmer uh, Javier Zamora and researcher Alyssa Olympi. Um, and then this past week, we also just released a songbird farm trail, which maps uh, farmers who have nest boxes. Thanks to all of our funders, including Department of Pesticide Regulation. And if you need to contact me, uh, there's my uh, email. Thank you. Great, thank you, Joanne. That was a lot of great information. Um, I'm glad to know that European starlings have a job <laughs> instead of being invasive. <laughs> That's good. Um, it looks like we have a few questions. We're going to go into our question session here. So let me go ahead and switch gears. Shall I start with that first question? Sure, go for it. Uh, so the question is, is climate change affecting bee populations? Uh, the, an the answer is yes. Um, and we actually have, oh, I think about 150 different species of bees up here at the biological lab, a, a pretty diverse bee community. And we're fortunate that we have now 
uh, 12 years of data uh, from biweekly samples of the bees in the same meadows where we're monitoring the flowers. And so I think we have one of the best uh, data sets around for trying to answer that kind of a question. And we do know, for instance, that even within within bumblebees, we have about a dozen species of bumblebees up here, uh, and we've analyzed the data for four of them. And those four different species of bumblebees are not responding the same way to changes in the climate and in the floral resources. So it's, it's tough to generalize, uh, but, but I will say that yes, the climate change is affecting the bee populations. Uh, I'm part of a group that's just gotten some funding from the USDA to establish a, uh, or plan for, and then uh, start a, a new national monitoring program for native bees here in the United States. And so uh, hopefully uh, in another decade or so, we'll have uh, information from a number of places around the US about what's the status of native, native bees. There's some uh, close to 4,000 different native species of bees here in North America. And we don't know very much about, uh, about most of them. Uh, we do know that flies are also important pollinators, particularly at higher altitudes. And unfortunately, uh, another long-term project here at the biological lab is monitoring uh, once a week, trying to, to get a census of insect populations up here. And there have been some high profile papers that have come out in the last couple of years from uh, first from Germany and now from other parts of the world documenting that insect populations seem to be declining significantly. And that's having a, uh, a big impact on insectivorous birds, but also potentially on pollination. And even here at the, in a site where we have no farming, no neonicotinoid uh, pesticides, uh, no recent changes in land use, uh, no street lights, uh, we're finding that there's a significant decline in insect populations since we started monitoring them in 1983. So uh, it's unfortunate that uh, that human activities and, uh, and, and climate change seems to be having a, a very big impact on insect populations around the world and consequently on, on birds that eat insects and also on, uh, on the process of pollination. Maybe, maybe I'll move down to the next question uh, since that uh, had to do with something I mentioned. So uh, our eyes, the eyes of humans, uh, have three types of what are called cones, cone cells in our retinas. And it turns out that birds have four kinds. And so different frequencies of, of light that are being reflected or absorbed off uh, by flowers, let's say, um, will stimulate those cones in our eyes. So when we see a purple flower, uh, what's actually happening is that a combination of red light and blue light are being reflected uh, into our eyes and stimulating those red cones and blue cones. And our brain is interpreting that as the color purple. And in the case of the hummingbird, certain flowers will reflect both ultraviolet and red at the same time and therefore stimulate the UV uh, and the red cones in the bird's eyes and produce some color that we haven't really named except that it, uh, we call it UV plus red. We don't know exactly how the birds are seeing it. Um, and um, so that idea of being able to see colors that are produced by stimulating two different kinds of cones at the same time happens both in humans and in hummingbirds, but with different colors of light because of the different cones that we have in our eyes. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we are over time. Um, I know we have a couple of questions left. I'm wondering if it's okay with folks if we pass these questions along to our panelists, if they might be willing to um, answer them in writing, maybe and we can pass along to those who ask them. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and we just had so much good information to cram into an hour. Um, so Shay, I will let you wrap things up. Um, I would like to thank our speakers today, um, Joanne and David. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. 
uh, to share everything that you're working on. Um, and uh, we have a couple uh, resources. Oh, also, I want to thank Pesticide Action Network, obviously, for helping me put this on and uh, helping fund these webinars. Uh, we have a couple of resources, uh, one for Pesticide Action Network, the honeybehaven.org. It's a pollinator website um, and then, or a resource, sorry. And then pesticide.org is uh, Northwest Center for Alternative to Pesticides uh, website. And you can access a lot of different uh, resources, fact sheets about different pesticides, as well as different pests that you may be experiencing. Um, but the, yeah, thank you all very much for attending. I hope that you, you gained a lot from this and uh, we will have one more webinar in this series coming out, um, hopefully in, I would say the end of October, early November, we're still working that out, but we'll get that up, information out to you. There's also some follow-up handouts that we'd like to uh, give you. Um, so we'll be sending those out after the webinar. But hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much for attending.